makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning and welcome to The Pulse, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. and Japanese stocks hit record highs as the Fed weighs data showing U.S. underlying inflation rose in January at the fastest pace in nearly a year. Thomas Jordan will step down as president of the Swiss National Bank later this year, ending an era where his institution was really at the heart of currency and banking turmoil that rippled around the world. Plus, China's factory activity fell for the fifth time in a row as weak demand continues to hamper the world's second largest economy. We also preview next week's NPC meeting. But first thing is first, so as always, let's look at the European markets map. Again, the focus is firmly on what we heard in the U.S. So we're seeing a little bit of a lift to a lot of these stocks. You can see the IBEX of FTSE MIB getting between a half a percent and eight tenths of a percent. Banking and auto shares seem to be leading the gains. And again, this comes after the Federal Reserve preferred inflation measure, which is personal consumption expenditure, um, rose in January at the fastest pace in nearly a year. But it's actually also in line with estimates. Sentiment also got a boost from jobless claims data that indicated uh, labor market is softening a touch. Now, Dell is also soaring pre-market after it reported a bumper sales and profit driven by the AI boom. Known for its PC business, Dell has attracted attention for its high-powered servers needed to run AI systems. However, Dow says, like many in the industry, the business is being held back by the availability of advanced computer chips. You can see pre-market Dell 21% higher. And commercial real estate lender New York Community Bank Corp said it discovered material weaknesses in how it tracks loan risks. It wrote down the value of companies acquired years ago and replaced its leadership to grapple with the turmoil. While well, Alessandro Dinello is to succeed Thomas Kanjemi as the firm's chief executive. And you can see pre-market New York Community Bank Corp down some 21.7 percent. Now, to talk about all of this, we're joined uh, from Munich by Ludovic Soubran. He's chief economist at Allianz. Ludovic, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know whether there's been a change in expectations because of some of the data that came out, that preferred inflation data out of the Fed. But how many times are you expecting the Fed to go this year? Uh, we, uh, good morning, first, Francine. Uh, I, I think the PC numbers confirmed the CPI numbers. So far, it was not really a surprise. Uh, we have the Fed uh, pivoting by uh, 75 basis points to 100 basis points this year. So uh, markets are catching up with us because we had this call for over a year. But you saw the year-end rally and the, the craziness about, you know, the March pivot that would have been horrible, I would say, for the uh, overheating of the U.S. economy. So we're still quite confident that the Fed has ample room to, uh, to pivot in the second half of the year. But those numbers, you know, I think uh, Goldman Sachs just published their outlook saying the USA powers on. It's incredible to see how much the U.S. still has in terms of engines of growth and inflation in this first half of 24. Yeah, and Ludovic, it's pretty incredible looking at some of the metrics, also productivity really soaring. Is there anything that makes you uneasy? How, how long can the labor market actually hmm. stay, stay at these strengths? Look, normally election year in the U.S., like 2016, which would be a good example because there is a lot of uncertainty about the outcome, is a year of muddle through where you have some sectoral recessions in the U.S. So the cyclical sectors, construction, you know, automotive are usually in down mode. And so that could create the end of so the so-called labor hoarding that some U.S. firms have been doing because they were waiting for the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies. So we are you know, we expect the unemployment rate in the U.S. To, to uptick, to tick up a little bit towards the second half of the year. But to be fair, it's still a very tight labor market. You mentioned the jobless claims. And it's not something that is going to be tremendous in terms of, you know, creating uh, the room for even a bigger pivot from the Fed because the labor market is still very tight in the U.S. I mean, Ludovic, it's very clear that today there's one story in town, and that's the fact that the S&B president is stepping down. We don't know who will replace him for the moment. There is a press conference a little bit later on. But does that change in any way how you're looking at Switzerland and the currency? Look, I, I think, uh, you know, at least the past year for Switzerland has been all about financial stability, right? So in the end, people didn't look so much about the, you know, the losses of the S&P. They didn't look so much at the currency, the strengths of the currency or the weakness thereof. Uh, but, I, but it's true that I think Switzerland is a very important uh, marker of this whole, you know, normalization and pivoting world. Why? Because it's such an important, you know, safe haven for the world. And it's also an important, you know, location for financial uh, 
for, for financial impetus, which has been a bit dented by the, the UBS Credit Suisse story. So I, I would say, you know, of course, the next leader of the SNB is important. But to a certain extent, what is more important today is that, you know, uh, Switzerland reassures their taxpayers that the massive uh, quantitative easing that has been done and giving, given back to shareholders, you've seen the results, I think you were in Switzerland for those results, uh, is something of the past. And that going forward, there's going to be even better surveillance on the on the banking sector in Switzerland. And I think that would be better for everybody, you know, around, as you can imagine, because of the cross-border uh, credit risk that has spilled over from that, uh, that that situation. Ludovic, you're like the central bank whisperer. So, is there? I mean, what does the next you know SNB president need to be like? Is it more of the same? Do you need someone more radical? Do you need someone that focuses more on politics? <laughs> uh, you know, I think we live in a world where, you know, you have to be a politician to manage the currency. Uh, you know, central bank independence is for the books. And I do believe that in an era where we have a lot more financial weaponization, we see that uh, now is the situation between the U.S.-China rivalry, but more generally, uh, the situation on, on currency and sovereignty going back to the forefront. I think you need someone who really understands what is the business model and the economic model of Switzerland, which is a lot about value-added exports in a world where trade is actually quite muted. So I do think you need someone quite political, unfortunately. But that's the time we're in. You know, It's the time of uh, war economics to a certain extent, where currency is a weapon. Um, we also had this, this pretty incredible survey, actually, that Bloomberg put together looking at what's worse. Is, is it worse that the ECB actually cuts too soon? And many respondents, a majority of respondents, think it's the big danger is the ECB cutting too soon rather than delaying it. Do you agree with that? Uh, uh, I would say yes, because then it will be uh, seen as the ECB... Uh, 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 throwing the, the stagflation baby with the bathwater. I think if the ECB cuts too soon because of the supply side inflation risks we have compared to the US, because of imported inflation, because of energy inflation, if we cut before the Fed, I think markets will sanction um, the, you know, the euro and will be long US, you know, very fast. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for financial markets, you know, um, uh, volatility reasons, I would say that's, you know, that would be um, bad for the ECB to cut too soon. But of course, as you can imagine, there is a social aspect to it. So you're in a situation of very asymmetric needs. Huh? Uh, the, the Eurozone is already in a no-landing zone. You know, we expect uh, GDP in Q1 to be zero at best, yeah? So I think there is, you know, yeah. a growing rationale about re-extending credit into the economy to avoid uh, the recession and to avoid certainly something where the uh, European or the Eurozone is really stuck uh, in a zero growth, we still a bit of high inflation situation. So it's a cash 22. I still believe cutting too soon would be riskier in the short run because that would, uh, you know, completely catalyze this idea of the U.S. overperformance and therefore sanction somehow the financial flows into Europe. Uh, Ludovic, what do you do with, you know, um, there, there's a lot of talk about, uh, of course, the tightening, quantitative tightening, which a lot of markets focus on, but we tend to ignore. I mean, this is an important component for the ECB. Yeah, well, we tend to ignore till the moment that they report their losses and you realize that, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the balance sheet matters. Uh, I, I think it's very interesting that, you know, we are normalizing rates very fast, but we're not normalizing the balance sheet as fast. Why? Because of fragmentation, at least in, in Europe, right? But it's the same in the U.S. It's because, you know, of the very strong corporate leverage. Uh, and the spreads have been really low and narrow, right? So, so I think there is this idea that balance sheet will uh, normalize at a much gradual pace to avoid that the whatever it costs that we initiated in 2020 when we were really worried about a financial meltdown is not all for nothing. You know, we didn't have this higher debt and higher inflation for nothing because we would reduce the size of the balance sheet of central banks too fast. But be careful because, of course, this is a contributor somehow, even if indirect and secondary, to the strong inflationary pressures that are still, you know, uh, rampant, you know, in the U.S. for sure, and somehow also in some places in uh, in Europe. But but I, I would say the pace is the right one, uh, but it's certainly not as normal as fast normalizing as it should if we would really want to get uh, demand-driven inflation and all these risks around rate price spirals and so forth back into their box. Yeah. Ludovic, thank you so much. As always, we'll have plenty more from thank Ludovic Subon, the chief economist there at Allianz. He's coming up shortly. Now, also coming up, we had inflation data from three of Europe's biggest economies yesterday. So we get the figures for the whole of the Eurozone. We look ahead to Germany. Actually, we'll focus in on Germany. That's next. And this is Bloomberg.
Now, two stocks we need to look at pre-market. Dell soaring pre-market after reported bumper sales and profit driven by the AI boom. Known for its PC business, Dell has attracted attention for its high-powered servers needed to run AI systems. Now, New York Community Bank Corp has also plunged pre-market. That's after the bank said it had discovered material weaknesses in how it tracks loan risks, wrote, write down, wrote down the value of companies acquired years ago and replaced its leadership to grapple with the turmoil. You can see 25% lower pre-market for New York Community Bank Corp. Also, euro area headline inflation data is due in less than an hour. Investors watching the state of the continent's economy ahead of next week's ECB rate decision. Well, our very own Zoe Schneeweiss joins us now from Frankfurt to, to discuss all of this. She's in charge, of course, of all of our um, central banking coverage. Zoe, so good to speak to you on TV. So we've had data out of Spain, France and Germany already. What can we actually expect from the wider euro area? So we get that number in about 45 minutes. Um, a reminder, in January, euro area inflation stood at 2.8 percent. Economists predict that the number for February will be 2.5. So that's a nice slowdown, that this inflation trend that policymakers have been speaking of will be on display. Um, Bloomberg's economics now cast would suggest even lower, would be suggest 2.4. Either way, that's not close enough to the 2 percent that the ECB does want to see, but it's obviously moving in the right direction. So you and I, Zoe, have covered many, many Swiss national bank pressers. Big news today that the president of the SNB, Thomas Jordan, will be stepping down after more than a decade on the job. You understand the SNB like no one else. Where does it leave the central bank? So it's obviously quite a seismic move, him leaving. He has been the longest serving central bank governor in the central bank's history. So in more than 100 years, no one ever served as long as he did. And he was just such a towering figure within the central bank and also within Swiss politics. Um, overall, Switzerland always is about continuity. And again, Jordan is not stepping down overnight. He's leaving in September. So we do have several months to go. Overall, Switzerland's continuity um, would suggest that the most obvious candidate to succeed him is his vice president, Martin Schlegel. Schlegel now has only been on the rate setting panel since um, 2022, so not even two years now. Um, and the third person on, the governing, uh, on that governing um, board, um, um, Antoine Martin, only started in January. So it means we will have a very new guard there. Jordan, even before he was central bank president, was the deputy and before that the number three on that um, rate setting board. So really he has dominated the Swiss central bank like no other. Thank you so much, Charles Schneeweiss there in Frankfurt, who leads all of our coverage of central banks. Now, later this afternoon, we'll also be speaking to the SNB governor, Thomas Jordan, and I think there's a little bit of a press conference ahead of that TV interview. Now, let's get more from our guest, Ludovic Subran, chief economist at Allianz. Ludovic, the one thing that's been keeping, I imagine, a lot of economists up at night is commercial real estate, especially commercial real estate in Germany. Is Germany really now the, the sick man of Europe? And I don't think Germany is the sick man of Europe, but I do think that the property sector is under a lot of duress, right? Everywhere we see it, but, you know, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. the, the atomized banking structure of Germany and the very efficient specialization, one would say, of some of these banks onto the commercial real estate sector create an additional layer of risk, right? Um, and I think this is something we need to monitor. The good news, I would say, is I have the impression that there is a form of bottoming out, mostly because demand for construction is slowing down very fast, and there are still some supply constraints, right? So, so we see some, you know, collateral damage, um, the insolvencies in the construction sector. We do see, and you've seen some some events, some some names, single names being at risk or being, you know, singled out. Uh, but I do think that the the bigger question we need to ask is what happens to the housing sector because no politician in Germany or in France want to actually support the housing sector with very strong fiscal. And I think that's a very interesting change of times compared to what we used to see before. So they consider this is out of their scope. They let the interest rate rise do their job to please a bit the sector, which is a sector where leverage has been power, uh, powering growth for quite some time. So something to watch, uh, this real estate banking loop in general, I would say. That goes for the U.S., that goes for the U.K., that goes for all of Europe. But it's true that Germany has really hit rock bottom, and we see that in the many leading indicators of the housing sector. But uh, Ludovic, is, what's the possibility of this becoming a bit of a, of a doom loop or, you know, some kind of big credit event that, that shakes financial world? 
Um, to be honest, when we scan the banks, the, the systemicity and the current uh, real estate exposure, we end up with a very few number of very small banks. But as you know, if something happens, it's always how you manage it that matters, these famous bail-in, bail-out type of procedures. And that's why there is so much urgency to uh, get the capital markets union going and so forth, because I think we're going to have some of these issues uh, popping up, you know, on credit trees and commercial real estate. So I'm not that worried about a domino type of situation. I wouldn't say even not at all. But I'm still very concerned about some uh, special names uh, in the banking sector where the doom loop for these particular balance sheets are quite uh, strong. Um, Ludovic, finally, what's your take on Argentina? I know you call it a catch-22. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I, I was in Davos when Millet was here, and he was like the gods of the gods. Everybody, all the libertarian attending Davos were so fan of Millet, and it took me some time to understand why. But I think everybody feels that Argentina is for sale, you know. So they all want to have some of these mandates on trying to, you know, power fuel growth in Argentina. Uh, the, on the ground, you know, he's had quite a few political uh, uh, headwinds when it comes to passing his omnibus law. Uh, and I think the main concern for me is today there is a lot of popular support. Uh, but the social cost of the devaluation and the fiscal consolidation are massive, you know. It really has a flavor of 2001, 2003. Uh, and so I wonder how long, you know, the international scene is very keen of Millet. The local people are still keen on Millet, but when the purchasing power is really going to drop by 10, 15 percent, I'm not sure he's going to still get this popular vote. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to see if he can really pass some of the massive reforms, even if they're watered out by Congress, and whether people are still with him, behind him, when there is a recession in the tune of 3%, as we expect in Argentina in 24, and the inflation is still high, right? Because it's not really getting under control yet. So that's that's where the popular vote keeps could be uh, eroding, and then the, you know, the Millet halo effect could actually disappear. Ludovic, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Ludovic you. Subrander, Chief Economist at Allianz. Now, coming up, we talk from the economics to geopolitics as dozens of Palestinians are killed near a convoy of aid trucks in Gaza. President Biden says the incident will complicate talks, but remains hopeful of a ceasefire. The latest from the Middle East next, and this is Bloomberg. U.S. President Joe Biden says he remains hopeful about the prospects for a temporary pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas, but that it's unlikely to begin by Monday, as he originally sought. Now, he cautioned that a deadly incident around an aid convoy in Gaza will complicate those ceasefire talks. Joining us now is Rosalind Matheson, Bloomberg's EMEA News Director. Um, Ros, is, is there, thank you for joining us. Is there really hope for a ceasefire before Ramadan? Well, at this point, we, we are running out of time. You know, Israel has made it clear that that's their timeline is the start of Ramadan, which is only a bit over a week away. Um, and if they don't have a deal then for their remaining hostages, they may feel the need at that point to go into Rafah. But there's still no clear plan for what happens to the Palestinians who are currently in Rafah. Israel says they should be able to channel them north, but there's not really a path for them to go. And as we saw from this incident yesterday, um, these fatalities around this aid convoy in the north of Gaza, there's obviously still desperate situations happening. Um, northern areas of Gaza, central northern Gaza, uh, the conditions for people there. So where are they going to go where they can be safe? And that's really a question as part of this. And now the US president is saying maybe not really Monday. They're obviously trying really hard. I mean, he had phone conversations yesterday again with the leaders of Egypt and Qatar. There are efforts to get some kind of ceasefire in, but they are running out of time to get it done. Yeah, we're also looking at pictures in Moscow. Alexei Navalny will be buried actually in Moscow today. What can we actually expect? Well, we're seeing some initial scenes of that and obviously a little bit of a crowd gathering. Uh, Russia has been cracking down on the protesters. We've seen some protests since the death of Navalny arresting those people. So making very clear, they don't want to have a big scene today. But we are seeing some people gather. Uh, it was very difficult for Navalny's or family to get a place to even have the funeral. They obviously want to make this into a moment. Also, Russia does clearly does not. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the size of the turnout, the behaviour of the police, obviously, around that. Um, and then what happens afterward? Because Navalny's widow, his wife, she's now trying to establish herself as that opposition figure um, in the wake of her husband's death. Um, after this moment, what happens? Is the momentum still there 
for her, particularly can she get traction inside Russia. So in a way we want to look beyond this moment also to see what is the trajectory of the opposition inside Russia. Vladimir Putin's going to get re-elected in a matter of weeks, he's going to have another term. Is there any room left for dissent inside Russia? Ros, thank you so much. As always, Rosalind Matheson there, Bloomberg's EMEA News Director. Now coming up, we're in conversation with the chief executive of an Italian challenger bank, Illimiti, as Europe's banking sector faces a more uncertain year. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. U.S. and Japanese stocks hit records high as the Fed weighs data showing U.S. underlying inflation rose in January at the fastest pace in nearly a year. Thomas Jordan will step down as president of the Swiss National Bank later this year, ending an era where his institution was at the heart of currency and banking turmoil that rippled around the world. Plus, China's factory activity fell for the fifth month in a row as weak demand continues to hamper the world's second largest economy. We'll also have a preview of next week's NPC meeting. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, two stocks we need to watch out for pre-market. First of all, Dell uh, soaring after it reported a bumper sales and profit driven by the AI boom. Now, known for its PC business, Dell has attracted attention for its high-powered servers needed to run AI systems. And New York Community Bank Corp has plunged pre-market. That's after the bank said it had discovered material weaknesses in how it tracks loan risks. Now, it also wrote down the value of companies Companies it acquired years ago and replaced its leadership to grapple with the turmoil. You can see New York Community Bank Corp down 26% pre-market. Now, it's also shaping up to be a more uncertain year for the banking industry. As a boost from rate hikes fade, the geopolitical risks escalate. Europe's lenders are also assessing the risk of the troubles in commercial real estate. So what does this mean for a challenger bank like to these illimiti. Well, Corrado Passera, the bank's chief executive, now joins us. Mr. Passera, thank you so much, as thank always, you. for joining us. I mean, it can't be easy being a challenger bank in these kind of environments. It's tough out there, interest rates, inflation. Like, what, what's it been like? A few black swans, actually. Just a few. Uh, just a few. In, in the five years of our short life, uh, we went through a number of uh, surprises. But uh, year after year, without interruption, Volumes have gone up. Now we are at 7 billion. Profits have gone up without interruption. Now we are well above 100 million uh, uh, euros profit per year. Very strong growth in revenues that is at the end the evidence of uh, what we are doing. And uh, we are at 360 million. Very, at the same time, in uh, situations like this one, you have to be very careful in keeping uh, uh, capital strength, right. yes. liquidity strength, uh, uh, quality of assets uh, uh, solidity. I mean, you have to keep everything under control while yeah. you're growing. But so you, how much do you worry, for example, about bad loans or people not being able to repay some of the loans? Uh, actually, that's not an issue uh, for the time being. Uh, certainly for our portfolio, we, are at, uh, we have an MP ratio of 1.2, so it's not a problem. But uh, at the system level, we don't see for the time being yet uh, uh, any real increase uh, in the deterioration of the portfolios. That, that's a good sign. Probably something will happen, but you know, especially Italian banks have really cleaned their balance sheet in the last few years in a major way. But Mr. Passer, how much do you worry about 2024? So 2023, you could argue, is actually quite benign, right? Now you have a very uncertain geopolitics. That seems, frankly, to be getting worse by the day. Yes. You have uncertain interest rates for the moment with the economy that could really take a downturn. Yes. You mentioned uncertainty. And probably the main risk we have in front of us is the accumulation of uncertainties. Growth, uh, geopolitical risk, technology, democracy, health, everything. So that's uh, the environment in which uh, CEOs have to manage their companies. Uh, I believe that uh, we are in the zero something uh, 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 level of growth and that's not enough. That is the main concern for me. We have to avoid recession because social malaise might uh, become too high. We have to work at the same time on productivity and on poverty. And growth is the answer to it. So monetary policy becomes 
crucial. So we had a survey, actually. We surveyed uh, economists who see one fewer cut now in 2024 than a couple of months ago. And basically, the consensus was that the ECB cutting too soon would be worse than delaying a cut. Do you agree with that? I believe we should give a clear sign that monetary policy has done its job. So maybe at after that, not too many reductions uh, one after the other, but let's give a clear evidence that what monetary policies could do has been done. Now we are entering a new phase. We have to foster growth. We have to avoid recession. So I would really expect a clear sign in the direction as soon but as possible. Do you start worrying actually about you know, consumer, consumer behavior in Italy? Do you see anything in the way that people are uh, lending, spending, using that's being hurt by inflation that makes you worry about a, f a financial credit event happening? High yields uh, have made investments more difficult. And that's why I strongly suggest our government, but the Europe in general, to do whatever they can to reward companies that invest in innovation, because that's crucial. I mean, for Europe, for Italy, for any other country. So, uh, for example, uh, any tax advantage you can provide to companies that invest, tax credit is the main instrument. At the same time, in my opinion, we should accelerate what I said since five years ago, federal investments in technology. Europe is losing the opportunity to be part of the new world. We are lagging behind in terms of be private companies. Yes, but you have to do what the United States have done, what China is doing. At the federal level, you have to really reward, help, incentivize, subsidy, whatever you can do to help, to encourage companies to invest in innovation. Because we are really out of the ranking as of today, and that's a liability, that's a weakness we have to uh, cope with. So Illimity is five years old. Congratulations. Five years old, Are yes. Are you working on, on a new business plan and what will that look like? Growth. Growth where we are at our best. Credit to SMEs. SMEs with growth potential, with uh, the will to go through the restructuring. Mm -hmm. So these are the two main areas. Going concerns with uh, ambitious projects uh, or with the will to go through their problems. Th that's really where we give our best. Less or even no direct investments in NPL, that's less interesting. Uh, right. It used to be part of our business, yeah. it's not anymore. We concentrate on going concern, we concentrate on SMEs that can grow, that yeah. can uh, pull the growth of the country. So uh, your share price has had a bit of a tough time. Yes. I think it's down 13% since November. Yeah. It's down significantly from when you IPO'd. Are you di what's the underlying reason of it? I'm sure you're disappointed uh, of that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but we know what we have in front of us. So, I mean, we are not uh, exploiting the increase in spread that the traditional banks are enjoying. We always remunerated our deposits. We want to keep doing it because it's safer from a balance point of view. So we are not uh, those, one, of those comp one of those banks that are really getting profits from just from, 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 from yields. At the same time, our exit from the NPL direct investment will help. Uh, and at the same time, uh, our results the continuous growth will show the market that we are worth much more than we are presently on the... So, Mr. Brasser, are you telling me that as a challenger bank you also have to be more generous with your depositors and the traditional banks? Uh, yes, not generous. I mean, it's really a matter of always keeping a balance between the duration of the liabilities and the duration of the assets. I mean, I believe in that. I mean, certainly you give up some profit margin, but your risk profile is much stronger and your long-term perspective is, uh, is stronger. So that, that's our choice. And uh, 100 million worth of profit and 7 billion worth of uh, uh, volumes is the evidence that uh, it's a reasonably good uh, uh, strategy. But would you take it back private? That's a question you shouldn't ask uh, to a listed <laughs> company. Uh, uh, no, no, nothing on the table yet, but uh, in any case, I wouldn't answer to that question. What's, what's your biggest concern over the next 12 months? I mean, we talked about you know, a possible mistake from, uh, from interest rates and from central banks. Geopolitics are extremely difficult, actually, to navigate to price 
Mm. That, what, you, that's your main worry? That's the main worry. I mean, uh, we are having at least two main war risk yeah. very close to us. Uh, that's the main thing. Uh, I would avoid uh, a recession because uh, if you add to this un geopolitical uncertainty also more social malaise uh, with so many elections coming out and with so many populists uh, using these uncertainties to trigger fears in the, in the, in the people, that might become the major risk. Do, do you feel like Europe as a bloc is a bit, is a bit weak? Because you don't have... It is. I, yeah. We certainly feel a lack of leadership. Europe uh, is one of the global powers, but uh, China is doing more, United States are doing more, India is coming up. Middle East is creating a sort of new pole of power and Europe is not expressing what we could do because we have to be aware of our social and economic model that is safer and probably more reliable than others. We are big. I mean, we are still one of the very big markets. We are not using our strength and we are not investing on the future. That's why federal investments so money that we raise together in a solidaristic way and investments we do together to foster innovation are in the common infrastructure has to become the priority. Mr. Passera, as always, thank you so much thank for, for dropping by our uh, London studio. That was Corrado Passera, Illimiti's chief executive. Now, we're also getting some UK PMI readings. Of course, it's 9.30, so we always have a bit of uh, UK data. Manufacturing PMI coming in at 47.5, pretty much in line with estimates, actually a touch above. It's the 19th consecutive month of contraction, but the highest reading since last April. So there you go. You can see um, Sterling 126.27. Coming up, the French construction materials company, Sangle bound results topped estimates as it agrees a takeover deal with the Australian rival CSR. We'll be speaking exclusively to Saint-Gobain's chief executive, Benoit Bazin. He's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, shares in Saint-Gobain have been slumping this morning, giving up earlier gains after the French construction materials company reported earnings. Now, earlier this week, Saint-Gobain also struck a $3 billion deal to take over Australian rival CSR. Now, I'm pleased to be joined by the chief executive of Saint-Gobain. He is Benoit Bazin. Mr. Bazin, thank you so much uh, for joining us. There's a lot going on, certainly, in your space and in your industry. The construction and renovations market for new homes and office buildings um, ha have been plunging after a pretty incredible couple of years. So what does this mean for Saint-Gobain going forward? Well, we have delivered a very strong set of results for 2023, you know, record operating margin, record cash flow. It means that the transformation of Saint-Gobain has delivered great results above the initial targets. And we have also given a strong guidance for 2024 that despite certain difficult markets going forward, notably in Europe, we are going to deliver the fourth straight year of double-digit margin. So I'm very confident about the prospects of Saint-Gobain going forward and very happy that we'll welcome soon Australian colleagues. It is a fantastic acquisition in the fast-growing Australian market. Yeah, but Mr. Bazin, is, is there something then that analysts aren't quite understanding? I know that share prices fluctuate, but at the moment your share price is down 4.5%. Were they expecting more? I think they don't realize all the support and the confidence we have on the margin. We adjusted a bit on their expectation for slight uh, negative organic growth. That may have been for some of them the slight difference versus the, the consensus. And slightly, we guide for uh, low uh, single digit volume down and a slight negative price for technical mathematical effect versus the strong average that we had in 2023. And I think the magnitude of also the spread on price cost with energy raw materials coming down may have been a bit underestimated this morning. So it's the first time that we guide at the beginning of the year for double digit margin. So that shows the confidence that we have on the transformation of Saint-Gobain and all the structural benefits. So again, I think it will take a bit of time for everyone to realize that, but it's first time we guide on the double digit 
and it will be the fourth mm -hmm. stretch year of strong performance of Sangram. So I'm very confident that any weakness is actually a strong point for some shareholders to rally. <laughs> and you're very good, Mr. Bazin. So can you give us a sense of, you know, these worry about construction and renovation markets, the fact that um, in, in many countries in Europe, they're taking a plunge. What does this mean for Sangoban going forward? You know, Sangoban, we are all driven by renovation. It's 60 percent of our sales in Europe. The new construction in Europe is only 12 percent of our total sales. And that's the area where we were negative last year and we will be negative in 24. But quarter by quarter, country by country, reaching a trough. So that's the good news. We have already reached a trough, for instance, if I take Poland, Eastern Europe last year, where, where we are up in volumes. So that's the new build in Europe, which is the only area where Saint-Gobain will see negative volumes in 2024. In the rest of the world, North America, Asia, emerging markets, we expect growth, and that's positive. And now, mm -hmm. after the huge transformation of Saint-Gobain that we have done over the years, we have two-thirds two-thirds of our profit coming from North America, Asia, emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a bit of disconnect between the top line, where we are still yeah. a bit more driven by Western Europe, but the profit, where we are two-thirds driven by North America, Asia, emerging markets. And that has been the success of Sangva and will remain so going forward. And, and I know you've also been reshaping, of course, Saint-Gobain's portfolio. You've exited, for example, distribution of your construction products. Um, do you still want to supply glass to the automotive industry? Like, how will you continue reshaping your for portfolio and maybe exit some of the markets? We are all driven by value creation. And, you know, the return on capital employed has been above 15 percent consistently in the last three years. Total shareholder return has been above 25 percent per year in the last three years. So it's all about value creation and therefore continue to make some trade offs on our perimeter with some exit of businesses which are far from our strategy or far from our financial expectations and then integrate well some nice acquisitions. The recent ones in the US on construction chemical have created value on year two, one year ahead of plan. Mm -hmm. So I think also Sangba has shown in the last five years a very strong high-level reputation on how we acquire and integrate yeah. fantastic businesses. So it's all about value creation. And yes, continue to reshape the portfolio. We are committed to that with in and out along yeah. this goal of value creation for our shareholders, good integration of acquisitions. Australia, I'm super confident about what it will bring to Sangba. We have more ideas in North America. We have more ideas in construction chemical. And yes, we will also continue to divest some businesses. So when you say more ideas, you'd be looking to buy companies. I know CSR is a big acquisition, so that will probably take time to, to pull it completely through. But are, is there anything in emerging markets or elsewhere that you'd be looking to buy? It's, of course, smaller size, but we did some in Malaysia last year, in Egypt, in Mexico, in Brazil, in India. We entered into insulation in India, where we have a very strong position on glass and plasterboard. So, yeah, there are many ideas around the world on emerging markets. And also in North America, you know, we doubled our size in Canada in the last two years, and we still have ideas to grow in North America. So we have two very clear and we have been very consistent on our strategic axis for growth. One is geographic mm -hmm. development, North America, Asia, emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And second is construction chemical. We will continue to push for that. We had, for instance, 11 acquisitions in construction chemical last year. And the integration of Chryso GCP is ahead of plan. We improved the combined margin of more than 400 basis points. That's a huge achievement. Yeah. We had more than 5% organic growth on those businesses. So a lot of good prospects for saint going informed. Mr. Bazin, thank you so much for joining us. That was Benoit Bazin, the chief executive of Saint-Gobain. Now, coming up, the world looks on as China's NPC meeting begins. We preview the many challenges faced by the leaders gathering in Beijing. Our chief North Asia correspondent explains next, and this is Bloomberg.
The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is A Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the so-called two sessions, the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, begin on Monday. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, looks at the many challenges faced by leaders gathering in Beijing. The National People's Congress, or NPC, is China's annual session of parliament, convened usually every spring in the Great Hall of the People next to Tiananmen Square in central Beijing. Essentially, the NPC sets the political agenda for the year ahead, when the nearly 3,000 delegates from around the country get their marching orders on day one in the form of a lengthy work report from Premier Li Qiang. While regarded as the highest organ of state power, the NPC nevertheless operates under the direction of the Communist Party of China. The NPC, by design, legislates and executes the directives of the party. The roughly two-week affair is colloquially known as Lianghui, meaning the two sessions, as the NPC is preceded by a gathering of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, or CPPCC, an advisory body supposedly representing views from the broader society and business community. Even though party membership is not required to be in the CPPCC, it is nevertheless directly supervised by the Communist Party. Well, that was Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Now, a couple of things we need to keep an eye on, of course, Dell soaring pre-market after it reported bumper sales and profit driven by the AI boom. Known for its PC business, Dell has attracted attention for its high-powered servers needed to run AI systems. You can see Dell pre-market gaining some 21 percent. This could also give a boost to some of their competitors in the same space. Also, New York Community Bank Corp has plunged pre-market. That's after the bank said it had discovered material weaknesses in how it tracks loan risks. Now, it also wrote down the value of companies it acquired years ago and replaced its leadership to grapple with the turmoil. You can see uh, New York Community Bank Corp down some 28 0.6%. Now, of course, the story today is European stocks in general rising over some of the relief after we got, of course, the U.S. inflation figure. Now, moves in global equity markets yesterday were positive because we had the Fed's preferred inflation measures, and that was on personal consumption expenditure. This is the data that we know the Fed looks at. It rose in January at the fastest pace in nearly a year, but it did match economists' forecast. At the same time, uh, some of the sentiment was soothed, I guess, by jobless claims data that indicated the labor market softening a touch. A reminder, also the other piece of news, is that the S&B governor will be stepping down in the second half of the year, and we'll be speaking to him a little bit later on. That conversation with Thomas Jordan this afternoon. Up next, Bloomberg Brief.